that you're looking for some easy plants that are off the beaten track. I'm not talking about your standard Sansevieria and Pothos and all of those, but something slightly more special. Stick with me and let's have a look at some plants that, in my opinion, are relatively easy to care for. Hi, my name is Memo, this is my channel, Have Planty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So today's video is going to be a tiny bit different. I've got some new fangled tech and I want to try it and see so you can actually maybe get a better view of my space. Now you might be able to see the camera twitching a tiny bit, but if I move, the camera now moves with me. So cool, basically. <laughs> I'll see about playing around with this a bit more. You might also now be able to see the Anthurium vichii is losing its oldest leaf, basically. But what I want to dive into today is certain plants that I know from caring for them here in my condition, the UK, in a conservatory, that have been quite easy to care for. And as I said at the beginning of the video, this isn't your usual fare of Yes, if you want an easy plant, go for a pothos, or go for a zizi plant, or go for a sansevieria. These are slightly different plants, and I'm going to try and mix and match certain genuses as well, just so that nobody's left wanting, if that makes sense. But, and I think, let me think. So we're looking at a philodendron, we're looking at an anthurium, we're looking at a monstera, we're looking at a hoya, and we're looking at a fern, and I think there might be a couple more here and there, basically. But shall we look at the first plant? And the first plant is actually one that is a fern. And you might be able to see now as I go around the conservatory and I can move it up so you might be able to see it slightly better. Let's see if it will actually capture it. So if I just hold you there for just a second. So you might be able to see the plant that I'm going to be talking about first up there. And so you can see the Hoya polynera or the fishtail Hoya has moved in now that the nighttime temperatures are getting a bit chillier. So the first one I want to talk about is the plant that's up there. And I've got it on one of the mounts that we were talking about with North, I know. Um, and it's doing exceptionally well. I think a lot of people found it quite entertaining when I gave you a bit of the tour. But that is the super bum staghorn fern, basically. So platycerium superbum, technically, is how you're supposed to say it. But it's forever going to be super bum. So that is surprising, I think, to a lot of people because I know there's another platycerium that a lot of people tend to get, which isn't the, the fronds and the leaves aren't quite in the same way that that is. It's a bit more, you've got the shield, which is technically that flat part of the leaf that you can see that's kind of curving around there. And then you've got the fronds, I think it is, that move outwards, which in this case would be the antlers of the mount, basically. So why am I including that into my kind of easy care houseplants? Several reasons. So I I'm not going to shy away around the fact that obviously you're going to need to mount that plant. You don't have to. Like, to be fair, I bought that from a garden center and it was in a pot. So you don't have to mount that specific plant. I chose to do that, but it's not necessary, basically. What you can do with that plant, obviously you can keep it in a pot, but the interesting thing that I found about that one, even though it is a fern, and a lot of my Australian viewers, I, uh, you might be able to confirm this, because I know a lot of you have mentioned on previous videos when I've kind of talked about this plant, that a lot of you might have it growing in the garden on trees, but with that plant as a fern, it's actually, I find quite forgiving. I, And I'm gonna be completely blunt with this one, that goes, bone dry before I water it. And I actually found that it prefers it that way. So it's a fern that doesn't need an awful lot of babying, and that, if that makes sense. And to be fair, even on the mount, I think I only really water it maybe once a week. So, and that's in here and it can get quite warm. Yes, there's a tiny bit of humidity in here as well, but I know from other people that grow this in regular household humidity and it's not that much of an issue. You might need to water it a tiny bit more frequently because obviously the, the water and the, um, there isn't that water and humidity in the air, so the water would evaporate from 
the substrate quite a bit. So the way that I've mounted that is it's still in the soil that it was in from the pot because anybody who's been here for long enough will know I do not want to be messing with fern roots. They're very, very fine, very hair-like structures. If I started to try to take it out of the coir, I think that it was in at that point, I probably would have destroyed half the root. So I left it in there, covered it in damp sphagnum moss, and then mounted it onto that mount. You don't have to use that mount. There's other options that you could potentially use. Previously, before I had the mounts, I just had, and I think I've mentioned this on a couple of my other videos, um, cork tiles. So as long as you put something like a janky support stick behind it or something to kind of make it a bit more flat so it doesn't wobble, you can kind of tie that around and it's quite a nice and interesting plant to have because of the structure and because of the way that the leaves are. But it's not one that's particularly difficult because, and I get this, and this is why I wanted to do this video, there's, there is a time and a place for the Sansevierias and the Pothoses and all of these things are, that are great as kind of easy care house plants. But at the same time, we all know that. I thought I'd give you a few specific examples that worked well for me. So let's have a look at philodendron now. So this is one that I've had on my channel. It was one of my first videos. I got, unfortunately, had to get rid of my large kind of tree size version of this plant. But this, for the people that have not been here for long enough, and I will be picking it up and showing you because this is quite a cool plant and it is variegated as well. And this is the Philodendron Birdie Marks Variegata. You're obviously in for a, a massive treat today because I've actually been able to get most of these plants off shelves and everything. So this is what is left of my tree Birdie Marks Variegata. And it's growing quite nicely. Does it need a few more janky support sticks? For the win. Now with merch down below. But this is one that I found it's very, very easy to care for, at least in my opinion. And this is gonna be the case for all of the plants in this list. By the way, you're seeing me kind of looking down at my hands. That's because <laughs> the water reservoir is here and everything is dripping. Because, and let me see if I can lift it up slightly without spilling everything. Can you see the roots? Yeah. They are everywhere and they're in that water reservoir at the bottom. This is a plant that will grow quite, quite happily. You might be able to see, if I bring it in, you might be able to see some of the roots around this plant. You can see through the transparent pot. But this is a philodendron that really doesn't give me an awful lot of grief. And it is a variegated philodendron of that, and it still doesn't give me grief. Yes, you're going to see that it's a yellow variegated philodendron. It's not that kind of lily white that you might want sometimes. And is this the best possible specimen? Probably not, but these are some of the last variegated chunks that I had from my mother plant before it went away. However, this is a plant that I have got cuttings and propagations of it all over the house, above radiators, in bright, bright light. It doesn't skip a beat. It does well in soil. The mother plant was in soil. It does well in pond. Absolutely no problem whatsoever. Is this one that I think is easy to keep the variegation? Yes and no. In the sense that, and I will agree with what other YouTubers have said as well, this is a great one to start learning about how to care for a variegated plant, especially if you want to avoid stuff like reversion. And reversion is basically the plant losing its variegation and going back to its natural all green state. And this is a plant that you might be able to see might do that relatively readily. You can see here that is a green leaf. And I'm trying to see, but the next exact leaf that came off after that had got variegation. So the good thing with this is that it's easy for you to see, it's easy for you to, to know where to cut on a node to then get rid of that section of the plant that is reverting. You saw me there just take off some of the crispy caterpillars around the leaves. The other thing that's quite interesting about this, and this is why I said it's not going to be your regular affair, can you see its growth pattern? And if I bring it in, you might be able to see there. So it grows in a really interesting fashion. It's not just like all the other kind of vining philodendrons that just kind of go up in a straight line. This kind of elbows out, if that makes sense. So this is really cool. You can learn about reversion. You can learn how to cut back if sections are being reverted. The thing I will say as well with that is your reverted sections are essentially a burly marks 
non variegated. It's a green one, so it's kind of reverted, but it's technically a green version of the Burley Marks variegata. Plant that up, propagate it, plant it up. Keep a green version somewhere else in your house. That's even hardier than the variegated version. That says a lot, basically. Or if you don't, grow it out. It will grow very fast on the all green format. But if you don't want to keep it, give it as gifts. It's nice and easy. This is the, the plant that keeps on giving. This was only a couple of twigs with maybe one or two leaves about three months ago. That's not bad. So definitely, definitely, definitely want to consider if you have not the Burley Marks Variagata. Shall we go towards an anthurium now? So this is one that I have mentioned on previous videos, and this is one that you don't see crop up too, too often, but when you do see it crop up, I would definitely say maybe consider it, because this is not your usual Anthurium chrysolinum that everybody is just like, oh, you know what, that's really easy, go for that, or the Clarinervium. This is slightly different, and it's got a slightly different leaf shape, but let me show you the plant that I'm talking about. So this is another plant that is in its reservoir, so I am holding things considerably, but I will start off with the roots, and then I'll tell you what plant this is. Can you see the chunk that is happening right up here, basically, in terms of roots? And even if I take this out of the reservoir, can you see the size of those roots? This is very, very similar. If you've ever grown a Phalaenopsis orchid, very similar. So you can see that it's kind of taken the shape of the reservoir as well. It's hysterical. But this, and let me bring it up so you might be able to see... Oops. It's been sitting in a really awkward place in the shelf, so it's kind of crinkled up more than it should have been. But this leaf here might be able to give you an idea of the name. There you go. You can see the cuffiness that is happening. That is the leaf. It's not because it was growing in an awkward place. You can see there as well. You can see that little cup. This is what's commonly known as the anthurium arrow. And I'm assuming you can probably tell why, basically. Um, there is a scientific name, and I'll add it at the top there. And as you can see, this one is curling in, but it's because it was sitting right by a plant shelf. It has got a semi-interesting inflorescence. I've kind of left it on there. There's another one coming up there as well. This grows vigorously. Obviously, you can see some watermarks on there. These are some of the smallest leaves. And I can't remember when I bought this. I will kind of add it at the top there. But there is another video when I was... I think I unboxed this as well. This is one from Grow Tropicals. The leaves are very, very thick. This was getting blasted with light. And you can see, if you are a fan of the dark foliage and theriums, this is definitely one that will pique your interest. Because even in brighter light situations, this has done exceptionally well. I mean, the fact that these are as stiff as they are, yes, I'm not going to lie, you can see the petiole to leaf shape. This is a tall plant that I think is quite architectural, and it's quite an interesting plant. This will definitely be a talking point when people come around as well. And this, you might be able to see with the cuppiness that happens there, you would imagine that biologically there's a good reason for that, and it will then scroll down, scroll down? Drip down the petiole. Now, you might be able, I don't know whether or not this is going to come up. Let's see if you might be able to see if I take my face away from there. You might be able to see there's some grooves. I'll see if I can put a close up. There's some grooves that are happening on the petiole which come down from that section there. So it would mean that it would just funnel the water down into the roots. This is growing in pond for me. I do need to get rid of a crispy, very, very old leaf there. Ta da! I've not tried this in soil. I think, Carrie, hi, I think you might be growing it in soil. I might be wrong. If you are, do let everybody know down below how it's doing for you in soil. If not, apologies, you're also growing it in saying hi to we both are, yay. But yeah, I think this is one that is very forgiving and it's interesting. And yes, I do know that you could go for the Clarinervium, the proper heart-shaped leaves and the silveriness, and you can go for the Crystallinum, which is the next step up. I would actually say, for me, this was even easier than the Clarinervium. And for the people that have been here long enough know that I have massacred my fair share of Clarinerviums. I cannot keep them happy. Grows beautifully. And it's an Anthurium. Remember, this is an Anthurium. They can be quite fussy. Completely fine. Completely and utterly fine. So let me put this back down and let's move on to the next plant.
So moving on to the next plant, this is a Monstera. And there's going to be a lot of people out there that are going to say, you know what, a Monstera is a Monstera, Monstera is easy. Yes. But even by Monstera standards, I found this one to be quite hardy, basically. And this is the Monstera Pina Partita. And I'll bring up my specimen so you might be able to see. It's still a baby, baby specimen, basically. But you can see it's got those kind of textured leaves. See the backs as well. Very much vibes of Monstera Spa Peru. They are different, I will say. Because when I was looking at this plant, I'm just like, oh, when well, it's really juvenile, it's really just a Monstera Spa Peru. Why do I want one? I've already got one of those plants. I do love that plant. The ruffling and the texture is slightly more subdued on this than it is on the Monstera Spa Peru. That is a very, very hard leaf. This is a slightly softer leaf. It's still relatively turgid, but it is definitely different kind of vibes. Is this slightly slow growing? In my experience, yes, so be warned for that. However, it is very forgiving. This one I've been growing it out for a while. It did take a beat to root out. So if you can get a slightly kind of this size and up, that would be good. I got like a one leaf cutting with maybe the tiniest bit of a root from a London uh, plant swap event that I went to like a couple of years back. So it took a while for it to get going, but it's the same with the Monstera Spa Peru. It takes a while to kind of root out. But after it's got its second leaf, I think, it started really kind of shooting up. And the interesting thing with this, and you can see that the way that it's kind of growing with the roots there, and if I take my face out of this, you might be able to see there, this, got, this has got a really interesting growth pattern as well. And this is one that will grow a leaf, a leaf, a leaf, a leaf. But because of that growing stem, eventually when this gets large, and you can really see those petioles from that middle central point that kind of almost looks a bit like a spine, kind of cool. This ends up looking a bit like it could be a, a spider, an arachnoid, or like something out of Alien. I don't remember what the, the, the thing that attaches on, and the Alien thing that attaches on, basically that's like a bit of a, yeah. The people that have watched Alien probably know what I'm talking about. I haven't got a clue, I haven't watched Alien in years, and I am a fan, but not a huge fan, so I don't remember what it's called. But this is very, very cool, and it does, grow quite nicely. I mean, it is a Monstera. I get it. I get why everybody would just like, you're showing us a Monstera. Monsteras generally will be quite easy. Not all of them. <laughs> Monstera, Oblica, Peru is all I'm going to say here. But yeah, this one is quite, quite cool and quite hardy as well. I mean, it's a Monstera, so you can probably underwater it for a bit. I do have it in pond and semi-hydro and I will show you the rootage that is happening on there. This has not got huge roots but they are relatively like chunky roots basically. So very very nice and different one that people might not consider is relatively easy but at least in my experience it has been. That yellow leaf is annoying me to no end so it will be getting chopped now. Ta-da! No longer offensive. There is another yellow leaf. Oh, there we go. This is a propagation from my white princess, but that's the lowest leaf, but I'm okay to lose that. So I do have a predatory satchel at the top of one of those leaves. So this will just move to somewhere else. It will move there. So it's still on the plant. I don't think there's any predators still left in that pouch, but there you go. Let's move on to another plant that's quite large. <laughs> And I'm trying to see how I'm going to get this into the shot now. So I might just shift you a bit and then let's have a look at it. So the next one that I want to look at is an actual Hoya. So this is quite an interesting plant to have in your collection. And I think this isn't kind of necessarily one of the rarest ones, but very cool nonetheless. Right, and let me pick this up now because this is a bit of a beast and I'm going to have to move like radiators and things around because right, you're going to need as much of the shot as possible with this one. Let me show you. <laughs> this is, and apologies the pot and everything, but can we with the size? The back doesn't look quite as impressive, but the Hoya Australis Lisa, when I've got tendrils everywhere basically, Hoya Australis Lisa, by far my most prolific growing Hoya, by far my most forgiving 
Hoya as well. And yes, before anybody says this, there are two plants in here, basically. So I did buy two plants, and people that have been here for a very long time and have seen original videos will know that this was a plant that I planted out probably two or three years old now. So it is an, an oldish established plant that I cannot tell you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine janky support sticks. Should this maybe have a different support system? Probably. Am I going to be attempting to detangle this and put it something else? Probably not. This will be here for a while now. And I want to see if I can lift it up without destroying absolutely everything. Let me see if I can take the cash po out Ooh. without it flipping everywhere. But let me show you rootage. So you might be able to see it. There you go. Can you see the roots down below? It's almost become a bit like a reservoir at the bottom now because it's dropped far enough now that I will always leave a tiny bit of water in the cash po down below that doesn't have a drainage hole and this seems exceptionally happy let me put this down and i can talk about this because this is very heavy okay wow well, exercise on a sunday when i'm filming that was a, that's one of the heaviest plants i've lifted so far <laughs> but yeah stunning 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 plant does it bloom prolifically for me most of the summer at this stage yes loads of peduncles loads of blooms does it have a particularly strong scent? Probably not. But for a Hoya, and generally Hoyas aren't that fussy as long as you kind of get to grips with it. They tend to be better, I find, for the underwaterers. So if you tend to overwater things, a Hoya might not be for you. It really will teach you to go slow on the watering. That one, unlike a lot of my Hoyas at the moment, which I have got in pond or kind of semi hydro mixes, which might be moving out of those at the moment because I find transition between seasons to be quite risky with them. I've had root rot every time, either moving from spring into summer or from summer into winter, and some of them I might not be able to salvage this year. But I've never had that problem with a lot of my Hoyas that are in a chunkier soil mix. And I did do a kind of in-depth view of the Simb oil, Simb soil, Sim soil. I'll add the link at the top there. And they actually had a specific Hoya mix. I don't know if Soul Ninja do. They might do. But yeah, that one I'm trialing at the moment and it's going quite nicely. But I do think that a lot of Hoyas, I think a lot of us attempted to do Hoyas in semi hydro because it would kind of almost make sense. I'd be curious to know from you if you've had good experiences in the long term. I'm not talking if you've done it for three or six months. Have you done this for two or three years? What have you found? Because I will say that a lot of my Hoyas that are still in soil, there's always that risk of root rot with the soil ones, tend to do a bit better for me, I find. So actually, a lot of the Hoyas that I've recently got, they're staying in soil, basically. So it is what it is. But that one, Hoya, I'm pointing down because I've had to put it down because of heavy. Super easy. Super easy. And it's, and it's a Hoya that, for me, has a bit more interest because it's got that variegation because the new foliage when it comes in is bright bright red and then it dies down to like a pink like a bubblegum pink and then it goes down to a peach and then it will go to a cream color and then it will go to a light green color there's always something interesting going on with the plant even when it's not in bloom so tick 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 a lot of boxes ticked as well and i know there's more interesting hoyas and the ones that look a bit more prehistoric ah do you know what years later the Hoya Australis Lisa, still one of my favorites. I find it interesting. It brings me joy. I can't explain it. The next one and the last one that we're going to look at is a philodendron. I'm throwing this in as a bit of a, this is really cool. I've not owned it for a full year yet. And this was one of my recent Equigenera unboxings. And I'll link that at the top there. But this is one that, again, not a lot of people will necessarily know about. But I have found it to be exceptionally easy to grow. and quite rewarding and you should be able to see the plant that i'm talking about just behind me here so this i'll try and bring it in into screen as much as possible oh, this might not be for everybody because this is kind of strappy leaves it's textured leaves it's giving philodendron as meryl dense vibes kind of basically it's definitely giving heterocraspidin vibes but can we just, this did not 
skip a beat. And sorry, <laughs> it'd help if I told you the name of the plant. It says the Philodendron Helenii, Helenii? subspecies Helenii. Hmm? So not one that everybody is aware of. I got this from Equigenera. I'm really hoping that this is a plant that we're going to start seeing a bit more crop up in more places because super tough leaves, leathery, grows upright and grows about a leaf each month at the moment for me. And it's doing really well. It's just a set it and forget it plant, basically. It's, it needs the same kind of watering as a philodendron would do. I have got this in soil ninjas. Is it soil ninjas? No, this is plant prescriptions, premium soil mix. Love the premium soil mix from plant prescription. I gravitate towards it so much now. It's absolutely ridiculous. Super, super, super good to use. I think anyway, I'll double check. I have got that on my plant care app, so I will see it up there. I'm kind of getting better at putting notes now on my plant care app. So when I do make comments like this and I'm just like, am I right or am I wrong? I can check it during editing and put it at the top. But let me show you some of the rootage you might be able to see there. I didn't actually notice this until I kind of properly paid attention. The roots are red, which is kind of cool. And the other thing that might not be super, super visible straight away, I don't know whether or not it's going to come up. Can you see that slight tinge? It's got the smallest blush on the join between the leaf and the petiole. And beautiful, beautiful, beautiful plant. I was excited to get this. I'm still excited to own this a few months later now. And definitely one that I think is just an easy care plant. It's just an easy care plant. And it's really interesting to look at. Does it get a bit wide? Yes. But does it also get tall? Also, yes. And I've got this on a janky support stick. The leaf is not sizing down in any way or form. If anything, it's still getting larger. So you don't need a moss pole for this. <laughs> multiple conversations with multiple people about the pain that is owning a moss pole. Do not worry. That video is coming soon, possibly next week if I can film it. But yeah, very, very cool plant. Definitely one to consider adding to your collection. A lot of us, even with large plant collections, we, we can have slightly fussier plants. Uh, might be displayed here by the Queen Anthurium. Not as fussy as I thought it was going to be, but still a relatively fussy plant for a lot of people. Same thing goes for the Melanochrysum up behind me, basically. So I thought, you know what? These are the plants that I found have been quite easy in my care. A lot of these plants, generally, I don't think most of these were ridiculously priced. Maybe the Helenia, and the Helenia wasn't even that expensive from Equigenera, basically, but the Hoyo Australis Lisa is generally readily available, at least here in the UK. The Plasterium Superbum, Superbum, uh, Superbum, is one that you don't see necessarily that often, but you can find it quite cheap. I actually got that on a clearance rack and it, I had to kind of nurse it back to health. And I think it was only five great British pounds. The Burley Marks Variegata, you are starting to see it maybe crop up a bit more now, at least here in the UK in some of the plant stores, not that expensive. The Pina Partita has kind of started to come into the market as well. So I thought these are, if not readily available plants, these are these are plants that with a tiniest bit of searching, you should be able to find it and they aren't going to break the bank, the arrow, the same. But they're kind of different and they're kind of easy, basically, because we've got enough dramatic plants. Occasionally, you just want to get a nice plant that doesn't take up a lot of your time, but does bring you a lot of joy. The other thing I will say, and you might have noticed this, maybe with the exception of, and I'm looking at the top there, the Plasterium Superbum, everything else, I think everything else pretty much, yeah, glossy leaves and slightly thicker leaves. That is the common theme throughout all of this. The Anthurium Arrow had glossy leaves and slightly thick leaves, the Australis Lisa, the Hoya, obviously, the Burley Marks Variegata, even the Monstera Pina Partita. So in that respect, and a lot of them had decent chunky roots or are prolific when they come to rooting out, it kind of makes sense. A lot of these plants as well don't really throw that much of a hissy fit when they go a tiny bit dry. Even the, Mon the Monstera, the Anthurium Arrow, doesn't 
mind it too much. It's still an anthurium, so you need to watch out for that. But other than that, simple plants. And you can see as well, like with most of these, the way that those leaves are leathery and they're kind of thick as well means that when you've got them in slightly lower humidity levels, it's not as much of an issue, basically. But yeah, that's what I wanted to show you today. Hopefully the the camera moving around hasn't been too jarring for everybody. I will see this in editing and I will make a decision on whether or not this is going to become a bit of a staple in the filming process, but hopefully you've enjoyed because you were maybe able to see a bit more of the conservatory. I know you were always asking to see more of the conservatory. This is the easiest way that I can do this because I am still self-conscious after years of filming this. I am not ready yet for anybody to be behind the camera and watch me talking to myself in my conservatory. So this is the best case scenario where I can get some movement without having another human being in here with me whilst I'm filming and I get really awkward. But yes, <laughs> hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.